Ghana's so different from home. And animals everywhere and just farmland and jungles and palm trees and the beach and everything was just very different. We got on the bus. I remember being so tired but I couldn't sleep because just looking out the window and seeing everything and we would just drive from village to village. But like in between villages was just dense jungle. <laughs> like you couldn't see very far. It's just trees and trees and trees and bushes and uh, it was sort of intense feeling. I remember one of my first funny cultural experiences was when the bus stopped for a bathroom break and I had to go really bad but everyone just got off the bus and they just started going to the bathroom right off the side of the road and I remember being so scared and thinking like whoa that's not okay so I, I held it because I was so nervous and scared to go. I didn't understand what was going on and it was it was kind of freaky. Not knowing though that that's just what you do, you just go to the bathroom outside, which was really hard for me at first. <laughs> that was a funny experience I had um, the first day. But uh, when we got to the to Kumasi, we got there about s probably about seven or eight in the evening, and so it was already dark outside. And I remember we had to charter a taxi to get to our apartment. And it was really nerve wracking because it's just these ghetto taxis and there's no set prices on anything and so you just have to barter with everybody on everything and so I remember sitting there listening to my trainer barter with the taxi driver and just thinking like whoa I can never do that <laughs> I it was really um, nerve-wracking so their food is really different from ours um, I think the only food that we share is rice <laughs> that's probably about the only thing that we have in common as far as food is concerned in Ghana, they sort of have staple foods that everyone eats every day. The first one is rice. Um, the second one uh, that they eat a lot is called fufu. And fufu is uh, it's a mix uh, with cassava and plantains, which are two sort of unfamiliar things here in the United States. Most people know what a plantain is. It's those green bananas that you see at Walmart. <laughs> that They normally have plantains. But uh, a cassava is a root plant. Um, it's kind of like a potato, but not really. <laughs> it's hard to explain. We just don't have it here. But what they do to make fufu is they boil the plantain in the cassava in a big pot, and then they pound it. So they have, a, they have what's called a mortar and a pistol. Mortar and piston, I mean. So it's like this wooden, this big wooden bowl, like a base, and then a long wooden stick that's like the wood on one end is like um, pounded in. Like, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> but so afterwards, when it's really hot, they'll put the, the plantain in the bowl, in the wooden base, and then the men will pound it. And they'll pound it and they'll keep adding pieces and they pound it and pound it and pound it. So it comes out and when, when they finish, it's sort of like, it looks like bread dough a little bit. Sort of that color of, like a creamy color. Sometimes like a little bit of brownish color. Tan, I guess you could say. And uh, that's their favorite. That's like Ghana's favorite food. Every day you'll hear pounding. Every time of day, all day, you'll hear, you'll hear pounding because they love their foo foo. And what they do is uh, they pour soup on it and you eat it with your hands and you use your fingers, you use your fingers kind of like scissors and you you cut a little ball off of the big lump you dip it in the soup and you put it in your mouth and you just swallow it you don't chew if you chew they'll get mad at you because it's like not it's not good manners to chew foo foo so you swallow it whole and the first time you eat foo foo you'll, you'll gag in most almost indefinitely because like we're not used to swallowing stuff whole it's a really weird sensation it's kind of slimy and gross but uh yeah the first time I ate fufu I gagged I almost threw up I actually did throw up in my mouth and then I, I didn't want to make them feel bad so I just swallowed it again and I just kept eating but I didn't finish my lump it was pretty bad even though I, I ended up loving it a lot but they have a lot of different ethnic foods. They have one that's called banku and banku is uh, that same cassava plant but they grind it and they dry it out 
and then they, once it's all dry, then they add hot water to it and they stir it in this big metal pot. And they, they stir it like this, like they push it up against the metal pot towards themselves. And it sort of looks like fufu a little bit, but it's white. And it's a little bit more sticky than fufu is. And it's the same thing now. You dip it in soup or stew and you swallow it whole. And banku is a little bit harder for new missionaries than fufu because it has a sort of a sour taste. Because when while the cassava is drying, it becomes a little bit like fermented. And so it has a little bit of a sour taste. It's better to swallow it though. Because if you try to chew it, you'll really get that sour taste a lot more. But if you just swallow it and get it over with, then you won't taste it as much. <laughs> oh, here's here's a word they use that we don't use. We have peanuts, but they call them ground nuts. But it's, it's the same thing. And then they have what's called ground nut paste, which is like peanut butter, but they don't add any sugar. They don't add anything to it. They roast the, the ground nuts or the peanuts, then they grind it in a grinder, and then it comes out. Uh, it's not as thick as peanut butter. It's a little bit more watery than peanut butter, but it's virtually the same thing. And so they use it a lot with soups and stews and things. They'll use that ground nut paste. And they have this food. It's called eto. And it's they boil plantain, and then they have these clay bowls that they make. They're like homemade clay bowls. And they have this grinder. It's a hand grinder. It looks like an hourglass, but it's just solid wood. And they grind the plantain in the clay bowl. Then they add the groundnut paste to it. And they'll add pepe, which is like red pepper. They put pepe in everything. Their food's really, really spicy. They put red pepe in everything. And so it sort of has like the bananas and peanut butter taste, but not as good because it's plantains and groundnut paste. <laughs> and then they add hot pepper to it, so it's kind of spicy. It's really weird. They put pepe in everything. I don't know. So as you can tell, like the food's really different. They don't eat anything plain. They have plain rice, but they they even eat their rice differently than we do. They have they have what's called stew. It's mostly just like onions, cabbage, tomatoes, things, and sometimes it's really thick. Sometimes it's really watery, and they just pour, pour it on top of plain rice, no salt or anything, and then they just eat it. I think that's why they use a lot of pepe because they don't use they didn't use as much salt. So they think that if there's no pepe, if there's no spiciness in it, then it doesn't taste like anything to them. And so that's why they put pepper in everything. Everything. Even they have porridge with pepe in it <laughs> for breakfast, <laughs> which is pretty funny. The people, um, as I mentioned earlier, are some of the nicest people uh, you'll ever meet. Um, very hospitable. Um, they have a custom in their culture. You whenever you're eating or whenever you have food, you have to invite everyone around you to, to your food. So if you have a bowl of fufu or banku or whatever, they'll always say, you're invited. Like, you're invited to come and, and join them. And if you, I think like in America, we sort of do the same thing. Like, we'll offer food, but we don't expect people to say yes. And even if someone does say yes, you kind of think like, oh, that's rude, you want to eat my food, even though we just offered it to them. Whereas there, um, it's different. Like, if they offer it to you and you say no, it's okay, they won't be offended. And if you say yes, it's okay, they won't be offended either. And they'll share their food with you. And even even though even if they're poor and they have nothing and that's like the only meal they're gonna eat all day, they'll they'll share their meal with you because it's really important to them to be hospitable and to be friendly. A lot of the times too, if they can afford it, they'll make more than their family can eat, expecting visitors. Just in, or just in case a visitor shows up, they'll have food for them. And sometimes the visitor, the no visitors will show up and it's okay, and they'll just eat the food later. But they always try to make sure there's enough food in, in case a visitor shows up that they can offer food to them. Um, another cultural thing is you never use your left hand for anything. You don't greet with your left hand. You don't shake hands. You don't pick up things with your left hand because... I mean, obviously, back in the day, they didn't have toilet paper in Ghana. <laughs> and so they would use their left hand to, like, clean themselves up after going to the bathroom. And so you wouldn't use your left hand for anything because, like, unsanitary. It's really inappropriate and dirty. <laughs> and so now they have soap and... 
they have toilet paper and stuff like that, but it's just part of their culture now. You just don't use your left hand, especially with elders, with uh, seniors. The younger generation is not as stickler about it, but definitely the older people, you don't want to use your left hand for anything. And the sooner you learn that, the better. Ghanaians, they travel a lot. They love traveling, especially in Europe, um, even in the eastern United States, you'll find a ton of Ghanaians. Oh, how special Ghanaians are and how privileged I was, I guess, to serve in their home country and to be around them all the time because they're just so friendly and so kind and so sweet all the time. It takes a lot to make a Ghanaian mad. And even when they're mad, they don't, they're not rash. Like I said, they're not violent or anything and it just passes and everything's going to be okay after that. So that's really sweet. Even the Ashantis, which is who I serve most with, they're, they're pretty stubborn people. <laughs> they yell a lot, but they don't ever fight, and that's okay with them. Even, they, even their language is pretty aggressive. And so when I first got there, I remember thinking everyone was yelling at each other. And I remember asking my companion, like, why is everybody shouting at each other? And he's like, oh, they're not shouting. That's just the way they talk. And so you sort of get used to that too. They just speak loudly and sort of aggressively, even though they're really pacifist by nature, most of them. Oh, there's a funny story. So <clears throat> in Chi, there's this, it's Debbie. Debbie means no. It's it, Debbie. And so my trainer, my first day on mission, kept on saying Debbie, Debbie, Debbie to like all these little kids. And I remember I turned to him and I said, like, well, why, why do all these little kids have the same name? Like, why did everyone, why did all their parents name them Debbie? And he started laughing. He's like, no, Debbie's not a name. <laughs> it means no in Chi. And so that was kind of funny, like, oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I was wondering why all these little kids were named Debbie, even the boys. It was kind of weird. I guess as far as weather's concerned, it's really hot all the time. Pretty much from for me at least, and for a lot of Americans, from the moment you step foot off of the airplane in the Accra airport until you leave Ghana, you pretty much don't stop sweating. It's just so hot all the time and really humid. Well, thankfully, Ghana's really safe. <laughs> Most of it's just drive-bys. They'll drive by on like a motorcycle and they'll grab your scriptures or your bag out of your hand and just drive off. But even that is really rare. I personally felt really safe all of the time, even after dark. Ghanaians are so nonviolent. They're the only Af they're the only West African country who hasn't had civil war since they've gained independence. I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. One thing is like the Ashanti tribe, which is like Kumasi region. They're probably the most influential tribe in Ghana, and they're they're pretty nonviolent. They're afraid of blood and stuff, and so they just don't like that kind of stuff. And I think because of that, there isn't a lot of conflict. There's a lot of verbal, they talk a lot. They'll yell at each other for ages, but they'll never hit each other. Like I, I don't, I only saw one fight once, and it was between two women. <laughs> sort of like a cat fight. But I never saw men punch each other my whole two years on mission. Um, so it's really safe, actually. I mean, apartment security is good. Sometimes you get random, like, because you have mosquito nets on your, or mosquito screens on all your windows to not let mosquitoes in because of, like, malaria and stuff. And sometimes, and then there's no glass windows. It's loose. It's like plastic. Like, there's a lever, and you if you pull it down, it opens the window, and if you push it up, it closes the window. So if you leave your windows open, some people will, like, cut your mosquito screen then they'll reach in and try to just grab whatever they can inside the window. But even then, it didn't happen very often. Ghana's notorious for being very safe. They have a lot of citizen police, I guess you would say. It's not legal, but they punish each other if you break the law. So like if there's a thief or something, then I won't be graphic, but they'll deal with the thief how they think is just. Um, and so it doesn't happen very often because people are scared of that. They know if I steal something, my life's in danger. And so they don't most of the time. So there's not very much crime. Yeah, Ghanaian English is... I mean, they were colonized by Britain, by England, and so they 
have England English, but on top of that is their local dialect gives them their own distinct sort of accents. And uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, one, like I said before, is the ER. Everything's uh, so Elda. That's what they'll call you, Elda. It'd be like, Elda Taylor, how are you? Say, I'm fine, oh, and you? I'm fine. <laughs> like, and they'll try to use English with you a lot, too, because they like to practice, especially the little kids. And they have a language, too, it's called Pigeon, which is, like, broken English. It's a lot worse in Nigeria, but Ghana has it a little bit. So like if you're asking how someone's doing, they'll say, how you day? I mean, like, how are you? And their response would be, I do, meaning, like, I'm good. <laughs> So it's English, but they just use it differently. Um, or like, what can be your name? It's like, what's your name? <laughs> like, my name be Seth, or my, my name is Seth. So they just sort of put words in different places than we would be used to. But if you listen really closely, then it makes sense. Maybe we say Peter, they say Pita. Oh yeah, they pronounce T's really well. They make fun of Americans because we sort of don't pronounce our T's. Like we'll say hat, like for a hat. But let's say hat. They pronounce that every, every T is really important to them because that's the way they learn it, I guess. There's a language family in Ghana, it's called Akan, the Akan family, um, which is, legend has it that it's sort of the original family that spoke this Akan language. Um, but as they grew, as the population grew and things, they needed to sort of find new land and find new space to live. And so Ghana has a number of languages that branched off of the Akan, the original Akan language. So chi is one of those branches, or uh, fanti. Fanti is another branch which they speak in Cape Coast, down in the south. Um, but they're really close, so like if you have a chi speaker and a fanti speaker, um, they'll understand each other. Even though he'll speak chi and he'll speak fanti, they can have a conversation um, because they're relatively similar. They have the same root language. Um, even though they're pretty different to the ear, they can understand each other very well, especially fluently. Because me, I wasn't fluent in Chi, and so they sounded quite different to me. But to their ears, it was enough that they could communicate, which is really interesting. And there's other Akan languages like Bono and different things. Uh, they can all sort of understand each other. But Chi is the biggest Akan language, like the most population of speakers in Ghana. And they say that uh, the Akans came out of the Senegal area, which is uh, way west coast, Africa, sort of by uh, the Gambia over there. That There's a tribe over there that kind of came down the west coast, came into what is today Ghana, and they sort of settled there. And so that's the history. They don't know, African history isn't very well recorded. Um, they have a really hard time keeping records, but that's like mouth to mouth at least. That's the legend behind it. But with Chi, it's a very simple language. It's written language too. I learned how to read it, read it but I didn't always know what I was saying because <laughs> they use English letters, but there are certain letters that aren't included and there are some letters that are excluded from English and they just pronounce it differently. So like we say A, they say A. Ah. And we're B and they be. So A, B, C, D, E. It's very like E. <laughs> Lots of E. The two letters they have that we don't have is O and E. So O is like a backward C. So there's O and then there's O. So that's how you pronounce it. Then there's E. Um, and then there's E, which is like a backwards. It's kind of like a three. Yeah. It's like rounded, around, around, backwards. No, not even backwards, so you're a normal three. Yeah. And uh, you pronounce it eh. So they have a phrase et sing, which is like, how are you? Et sing. And that eh sound is the, is the three. The, the eh. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> but the Ghanaians love it when you do speak their language. When you speak chi to them, they, they, they feel this a kinship. Even though Ghanaians are the friendliest people you'll meet on earth, really. Yeah. 
even even within Africa, people say Africans are friendly. Ghana is sort of the epitome of friendly Africa, the friendliest people. Um, but then speaking their language just makes it that much better for them. Okay. And so, I mentioned one is et to sing, which is how are you? And the response would be eye, which means like I'm fine. Um, or another response to that would be boko, which is like cool, I'm cool, <laughs> everything's cool. <laughs> um, another common one is uh, wodinde sing, which is what is your name? And the response would be uh, medinde Seth or whatever. If you're an elder, my name was Elder Taylor. And you have to say it sort of in their accent. So it'd be Medinde Elder Taylor. So the ERs, they don't have er, they don't pronounce, they think it's really difficult. And so ER ends up sounding like an A, like an uh. So it'd be Elder, Elder Taylor was my name. So Medinde Elder Taylor, my name's Elder Taylor. Woofrihing. It means, <laughs> this sounds funny, huh? Wufrihin is like, where are you from? And uh, uh, you'd say, me free US or me free Ghana or wherever you're from. So yeah, that's just a couple phrases from Chi. Sounds kind of funny. And my accent sounds funny, I'm sure. But um, that's how they say it. A lot of Americans, when they go, they'll, they'll speak Chi, but with like an American accent. And it just isn't doesn't sound as authentic. <laughs> so if you go and you try to learn their language, listen to them really closely and try to move your mouth the way they move their mouth or try to sound the way that they sound. Because it's not just about saying the word, but saying it the way that they say it. And it becomes really meaningful to them.